We are starting now the digital poster lightning talks and uh, it's an honor for me to, to share this session. My name is Marcel Burstein. I'm a professor in the University of Brasilia in the Center for Sustainable Development. My background was in sociology, economics, planning, and I'm doing my best to become a, a specialist in generalities. <laughs> well, the, the task is quite tough because we have six presentations, each one lasting no more than three minutes. Uh, we have as uh, mo uh, moderator Lynn Joy Thompson, who will be in contact with the online audience, and we have the very important contribution of Alison, who is holding the bell. She's going to ring the bell after two and a half minutes and for each presentation, then there will be half a minute more. So let me start. I'm going to read the name of the uh, speakers and the institutional affiliation so that they, I can spare them from half a minute presenting themselves and their institutions. Some of them are very large, the name. So first, I'm going to invite Dr. Ian Elson from the Australian Un uh, National University. Thank you. So I'd just like to talk about uh, a few things I've learned from 25 years of grappling with how um, researchers can maximise the social, environmental and economic impact from their research. And it's mostly been with CSIRO. So the, if researchers want to have impact, they need to actually understand the context in which their research is going to get used. And the research results aren't used solely by the uh, organisation to which they're transferred by the researchers. That's the initial adopter. Um, rather, um, those research go, results go into a whole research, um, receiving ecosystem of people and organisations. And researchers actually need to understand how that ecosystem works if they want to maximise their impact. Um, and to do that, researchers need to get close to the microphone. Um, it's really helpful if they set up a path to impact. So that's all the steps required to go from their research results to the desired impact. Um, and that will almost always go beyond the initial adopter of the research results. And my experience has been that the single biggest barrier to researchers having impact is they focus on a single element along that path to impact. And typically that's the initial adopter. The customer, the people they give the research, research results to, they just focus on them. Sorry. Um, so the fundamental underlying issue um, to having impact is it requires people and organisations to change their behaviour. They're going to do something new. And the motivation to do that can be markedly different for different elements along that path to impact. And researchers need to understand the different motivations because that will actually influence how they go about their research and transferring results to others. For example, I hear a lot of people talking about, talking about policy impact, but policy doesn't have impact. Implementation of policy has impact. And that requires program design and delivery and the target population to change their behaviour. And the whole chain has to work. And so the maximum, to maximise your impact, you need to look at the most effective policy program system and not necessarily the best policy taken in isolation. So you may have a less good policy by some criteria, um, which leads to a more effective chain, uh, which leads to implementation. So I guess finally, to say that if researchers want to maximise your impact, they, have to, they really should be incorporating factors from along the whole path to impact back into their research when they undertake it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ian Elson. Uh, I'm uh, inviting now the second speaker, Professor Jeannie 
Jenny Stewart from the University of New South Wales, Canberra. Well, Marcel has already introduced me, but I feel I should say something about my co-author on this paper, uh, Dr. Wendy Jarvie. Uh, Wendy has an evaluation background, but perhaps even more importantly than that, um, she used to be a very senior public servant. So it was the collaboration with her that kind of helped both of us, I guess, prize open the black box of government, which can be such a challenge for, for all of us as as researchers. In our work we are interested in evaluation, which I guess is a special kind of research. Um, it's research that's a bit closer to the policy process. And in this case, the particular case study that we looked at um, involved some pretty gold star evaluation work. So I know I don't, I don't have many seconds here, but I might just say a little bit about, um, about the case study. Um, it was a set of trials of new ways of working with Indigenous people, and those trials were, were subject to a very sophisticated form of evaluation. So ideally, I guess, we would have expected um, the results to be used by policy makers, because essentially pol policy makers instituted the evaluations in the first place. Now we do know that there are many impediments um, to evaluation use. Where we thought our value added lay is that we looked at the role of public servants, bureaucrats and the organisations in which they work and we asked, well, how did, how did the way public servants think about this particular case? Um, influence the uptake or not of evaluation. We did quite a bit of um, empirical work on this, as you can imagine, lots of interviews and so forth, but I guess I just have to cut to the chase um, for my presentation now. Briefly, we identified four impediments to learning in this particular case. and uh, It's really quite heartening, I guess, to see that um, these impediments, with perhaps some, some differences in emphasis, do line up with some of the work that others have reported on um, in our conference today. The policy environment was highly politicised, yes. The results, which essentially required um, implementers to listen to Indigenous communities, that uh, challenged accepted ways of working. There were no systematic processes for policy learning to occur. That's something we've tried to change since, but uh, with no success. The fourth one, the tendency to label rather than to learn, is the one I'd like to just end on. The, the, the trials actually pointed to some, some successful avenues of intervention, but somehow in the process of bureaucratic politics, um, those successful interventions somehow got labelled as failures. And we figured that that was really a way of not learning, um, of stereotyping results that were inconvenient. Okay. That's <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, may I invite now the third speaker, Dr. Daniel Walker, Chief for SCSIRO Division of Ecosystems uh, Sciences. Thank you. So, so this um, brief presentation is, is talking about a case study poster we've put in looking at um, learning from agricultural research and development in sub-Saharan Africa. My first slide shows the, the theory of change that's used by the Australian government, so uh, investors in, in research for development in, in sub-Saharan Africa, to inform their investment decisions. Now, you'll be glad to hear in three minutes, I'm not going to explain this, this diagram, other than to say this is a distillation of the experience in the development community in Australia, in research for development community in Australia. It uh, integrates uh, um, a lot of experience, a fair bit of wisdom, 
probably a bit of ideology and a bit of path dependency and some, some random thoughts, but it is a very influential tool in that it underpins very significant, significant investments that are made in, in food security interventions in Africa. So Australia is not a, not a major player in research and development in Africa, but, but a very significant investor from the point of view of our, our um, overseas budget. The question about this diagram is how much the, the causal relationships that are captured in this diagram, which, which inform the investment decisions, are evidence-based and how much they are, they are actually actively reviewed and tested in, in a learning process uh, moving from one program to the other. So uh, all the aid programs will have evaluation processes that the, the, the critical question is how the, the learning experience from those investments is captured um, and taken into future investments. So the, the project I'm reporting on was a, a case study looking at um, trying to develop a more evidence-based approach to, to learning from that experience um, in food security interventions. And we structure this around developing a set of propositions for good practice in food security from a review of <clears throat> initially seven very major programs, both Australian and, and international programs, um, uh, but, but ballooning out from that uh, based on expert opinion and, and documented experience to develop a set of, of 40 propositions. And these were not the self-evidence of axioms that people take into development, nor were they a, a whole set of observations about what worked and what didn't in a particular context, but, but if you like, a set, of, a set of issues that had some real tension around them. We've developed a set of 40 core propositions, and then, which was fairly, relatively straightforward, but then tried to go out and, and get an assessment of the strength of supporting evidence for those propositions, um, the assumptions behind them and the implications of those assumptions, very important, the counter views to those propositions, so there's, there's a very contested issue, what, what are impediments to food security in Africa, implications and, and, secu and consequences for food security outcomes. The intention in doing this is not to have the 10 definitive uh, steps for successful food security investments in Africa, but rather to create a set of boundary objects in these propositions that capture, capture and, and distill critical debate for future investments and to stimulate the debate and learning through the process to, to continue to test and refine and extend those propositions. So this is, this is a work in progress, uh, but something I think has been fairly well received so far. Thank you. So thank you, Daniel. I just remind you that we, we, we're having 12 minutes for Q&A after this presentation, so prepare your questions and in a brief and direct way so that we can enjoy these 12 minutes. So let me invite now the fourth speaker, uh, Timothy Neville, Neville uh, from the Defense Science and Technology Organization. Thank you. Um, just briefly about DSTO, we're part of defence and we're the national security and um, defence science and technology research key body. Um, we farm out some stuff, we do a lot of stuff in-house as well. It's about 2,200 of us um, over six areas. Um, our work ranges from lab-based research, um, looking at material science and radar and um, and, and nutrition through to more um, implementation and integration sciences where we are looking at the um, at partnering with um, defence force personnel at the acquisition, maintenance and application of defence capability. Um, my team works at what you would say is the pointy end of this um, scale um, where we're providing um, direct scientific advice to the commanders of our current operations. Um, from Afghanistan to East Timor to border protection to what I'm talking about today, which is um, uh, disaster relief with the Queensland floods. Um, the problem space here is that the Defence Force conducts humanitarian assistance and disaster relief um, in a multi-agency whole of government um, response to disasters. We don't, we don't own anything here, we just provide a capability that the federal government gives to states or gives to other nations to um, help them in a disaster. Um, and the problem is how do we best collect and analyse the data to better inform the planning for the next time we go and do this. Natural um, disasters are going to happen again and we're going to be asked to support them again. Let's do it better next time. Um, constraints and complexity with the problem though is that there's a lack of quantitative data. There are many levels of abstraction here. 
um, from soldiers on the ground to generals walking behind the Prime Minister with flooded rivers behind them. Um, there's technology, um, sorry, terminology and cultural differences between the way defence operates and the way the whole of government operates, and I'm sure any public service in the room can see this in their own environment. And there are many ill-defined boundaries and multiple points of interaction, uh, multi agency whole of government, federal, state, um, that as researchers we have to uh, map out before we go into the environment. And, and finally, and it's a bit different to what we just heard, that when defence goes and does this, they get it done and there's no problems. So how do you get, tell them to improve? How do you ask them to improve when they've done a good job? Um, the approach I used um, is a um, method of dialogue methods, coding and social network analysis with some graph theory. Um, and the approach managed to remove bias but keep a, a strong evidence chain and I implore you to look at it um, online if you want to know more. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Um, the fifth speaker is Buddy Harianto from the Department of Environmental Health and Research Center for Climate Change, Universitas Indonesia. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to start uh, my presentation today with one sentence. One question. Am I a knowledge broker to help me finding out? I'd like to uh, bring you with uh, my experience. Uh, what am I doing? What I have been doing since uh, two decades ago as a university uh, academic, academician, then uh, I have to do research and luckily it is a, I do research in air pollution, health impact in the children and so on. It is a real problem. And then the finding uh, uh, disseminating to uh, openly re uh, seminar workshop with a, a limited uh, audience. Uh, this is a common in a university because of limited funding. but. Then, after this uh, dissemination in the limited audience, uh, having interest from other donor agency, we can make a wider uh, occasion in the international seminar or national seminar and so on like that. Then, again, uh, the finding can be disseminated to more others. Uh, among the participants, uh, we also have uh, interesting uh, NGOs, with uh, uh, environmental NGOs usually, and then uh, they uh, ask me, sorry, they are uh, willing to be the uh, whistle blower for the findings. And then inviting the media, they ask me to be, uh, to present the findings, and then again media uh, disseminating the the finding with the more uh, common language. Uh, after that, the usually the government, uh, when after reading, after having the the uh, pressure from the NGOs, then they invited me to be the one of the team in developing draft of uh, regulation. Okay, and the process also involving other uh, expertise. Then after that, when the regulation be launched by the government, they invited me again to present what are uh, the problem underlying of the regulation. It means that I'll be the messenger of the government. And of course, uh, by reading the I2S book from uh, Gabriel, uh, I'll try to put 
all of the things I did with the, all of the questions. And the last slide, I'd like to emphasize that using the media is a very effective way to translate the finding, uh, research finding from university to the common language. And the final uh, word that I would like to say, please help me, who am I? Thank you. Well, thank you, buddy. And I'm inviting now the speaker number six, Sophia Vincent, uh, Department of Industry, Innovation, Climate Change, Science Research, and Tertiary Education, Australia Government. It takes around five, uh, 30 seconds to read all that. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for reading that for me. I knew that would take up a bit of time. Um, so I've recently been involved in a project looking at how we can increase the use of research within my department. And that's in recognition of the fact that many public servants um, don't use enough research, let alone integrated research, um, to help inform our decision making and address complex and wicked problems. So we did a survey across the um, Australian government. And here, these are some of our results on the biggest barriers to the use of research. The first being a lack of time, but there's also some uh, lower hanging fruit that we've tried to address, being insufficient forums or networks, difficulty accessing our research, and uh, other things like not knowing who and how to contact. Um, and I'd add an additional barrier of why we don't use integrated research, and that's because policy, like uh, much of academia, is, can be developed in silos, and we often have to make really concerted efforts in order to bridge the gaps and have complementary um, responses that work across different departments. So a couple of the responses that my department has initiated um, for this review included the establishment of the strategic research network um, that I now manage. Uh, and this brings together managers across my department who are either involved in strategic policy development, uh, conduct their own in-house research, or have multiple research contracts. And the aim is to get them to talk to each other about the different projects, help to refine their research questions and um, policy questions. And this, this act of getting people together has been really successful in, in aiming to bridge the different um, disciplines and policy fields. We also um, bring in academics and try to let them showcase their work to the department, to an, a field of, um, of interested policymakers. And we're looking to s set up um, skills workshops to help build the capacity of policymakers. And I think that a lot of the um, tools and methods that we've discussed at this conference, like um, soft systems, mapping, and dialogue methods, would be a really useful tools for um, many parts of policy. And just quickly, another initiative that we've got now, recognizing that many academics find it difficult to contact public servants as well. I think the, the black box, as um, Jenny described it, we've established a portal on our website where anyone can send in uh, your research journal, report, or just an evidence-based policy idea. And this will be disseminated to the appropriate area in the department, just for information or maybe for a follow-up meeting. Um, and we've got lots of, this is one way to try to create an entry point and bridge the gap between um, research and policy makers. So we've got a lot more initiatives. My main message is just to encourage people to really contact the public service. You often have a really open audience who, who are looking for new ideas and just for, for a few reasons or not don't often get to academia enough. So thank you. Thank you, Sophia. So, as promised, we have now time, not very much, but time for questions and answers. Uh, I'd like to invite the six speakers to come to the stage so that we could easier, could be easier to respond to the questions. Uh, initially, uh, let me ask uh, Alison if she has some question coming from the audience. No, probably at night over there. So, it's open for this audience. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Tad Masuda uh, from uh, the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature, Kyoto, Japan. And thank you for the very impressed presentation to, to, in spite of the, uh, such a short time. And uh, 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 li after listening to the uh, presentation by the Dr. Budi or Tim and Timothy and Ian, uh, I'd like to raise a question regarding the uh, research as the responsibility and role in the transdisciplinarity research. Then uh, we learned the uh, implementation sciences and its approaches. And uh, yesterday, so someone says that the researcher is not a consultant. Or uh, another presenter, John, uh, said the uh, uh, researcher is a, a storyteller or something like that. Then um, many stakeholders uh, involved in this uh, transdisciplinary research and uh, 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 tackled with uh, policy sensitive issues. Uh, could the researchers uh, keep uh, uh, policy free or uh, neutral position? And, uh, do you have some uh, experience about this issue? Do you want to answer? Okay, uh, thank you. Actually, I, I, I wish to have the answer, who am I? But this, okay, uh, uh, this is actually my uh, uh, experience, historical of my life experience as a, a researcher in a university. Then this, it is luckily that when <coughs> uh, having the finding from the research, uh, because of the real problem research, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in the beginning, I, as an epidemiologist and uh, as an environmental health expert, uh, uh, this is my nature to see the, the data, to see the, the situation uh, 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 naturally in, 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 in the environment. Then I found that uh, increasing number of uh, uh, diseases related to environment is uh, slightly increased in Indonesia from year to year, then I have to uh, do something about this. But because I'm a university uh, uh, officer, then I have to do only research. But after having the finding that, so what? Then uh, uh, luckily, uh, some of my uh, colleagues from NGO and so on, they asked me, do you have something to be announced to the public and so on? Yes, I have this, I have finding this, I have finding this. Okay, let me ask the whistleblower, they asked me then, they, they try to uh, make a software conference or something like that by their own money, they find, they try to find uh, money, then, then they invite uh, uh, media, then, yeah, the, the, the process uh, goes, and then uh, not only like that, but uh, they also in the in the in the serious problem like uh, the very bad uh, air pollution condition in in Jakarta, for example, uh, the because of there is uh, regulation before uh, this this must be a responsibility of the government of governor of the uh, Jakarta, then. The NGO tried to use my finding to send subpona to the government. And because of this pressure, the government then uh, initially invited me as the person who <laughs> got the finding then. Okay, you, you and I was our team. Let's do uh, something to make a regulation to fight, uh, to prevent the, the this, this, this problem. And then after having the problem, uh, after having uh, the, the regulation for one year later with a process of a uh, very long process, then uh, when uh, the announced of the regulation, they invited me again to, uh, uh, to be the one of uh, the person who also, uh, so in the socialization of the regulation, I'm also the one of the speaker in there. Uh, to to socialize the the uh, the finding and also the regulation. So in 
this uh, uh, I mean this is uh, actually uh, the bridging risk from reset until to the policy thank you okay thank you uh, let's continue for is, are there any questions coming from the audience no from the online no so I will ask you to try to be as fast as you can for the questions and for the answers it's like a ping pong okay okay so I'll be quick as I can and my questions for Sophia or not so much you personally Sophia but your department um, it really, really bothered me, uh, the model of innovation of your department and also in your talk just now, that the whole emphasis on being open to researchers narrows down immediately to evidence-based research, which is, you know, um, in Britain a report about the different disciplinary contributions, especially of the humanities and social sciences, to the wealth of the British nation did uh, argue that we needed to shift away from this discourse of evidence-based policy to research-based policy. And, um, you know, because that ex includes the humanities and social sciences. I went and looked at that portal and I felt there's nothing for me here and yet I know I have a lot I could offer that department. So I'm just wondering what the chances are of you taking uh, Michael's toolbox of uh, uh, evidence and all this sort of stuff and getting some people in your department to work on it and maybe rethink some of the assumptions, the positivist assumptions that are built into Australia's innovation framework to the exclusion of humanities and social sciences. It's not ping pong, just chess game. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for that feedback. Um, that's certainly not the um, the intention of the site. We really are open to a broad range of research, not just quantitative evidence or a positivist um, discipline by any means. So it's really good to hear that so we can maybe reevaluate what it looks like because we're open to all research. The department really does consider, you know, case studies, qualitative work and um, from a broad range of disciplines. We have um, policy responsibility for um, education and science and these really cross a broad range of, of disciplines. So, yeah, I'll, I'll work on that and it certainly um, doesn't mean to be narrow. Thanks. Thank you. Any other question? I, Gabriele had a question. Look, I just want to pick up on what Zoe was just saying. Your department, the Strategic Research Network, was actually set up by a very innovative group of people representing Sydney University, ANU and others. And the whole point of the title in Strategic Research, and it was actually assessment, the idea was a star network, not just an SRN, uh, was that it was entirely inclusive and there was an amazing group of people that came together to form that department. So I'm, I'm, I'm really disheartened, as Zoe is, to find this collapse in exclusive, you know, become an exclusive elite if we're not careful, and elitism, which has been the devil, which as has been mentioned, the British have been trying to get rid of to achieve inclusive designs of their structures and institutions. I'm Associate Professor Simon Ray Atkinson, so I'm, I'm really disheartened that the ideas of the ANU and others at Sydney University for an inclusive body within the heart of government, i.e. the Strategic Research Network, which came from work that I was passionately involved with in the UK before and defined some of that, has, has come, to, come to this narrow collapse and oh, I, I despair. Who's going to answer? Is that to you maybe coming from the defence department's perspective? Do you have anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so to that, um, sorry, the last speaker. Um, oh. Last speaker, I think you might, is that the Strategic Policy Network is a department of uh, a, a whole of government policy network which is uh, got a similar initiative and this is... No, it was formed from within your department. It was some exceptional group by uh, an amazing public servant and it's, it's like the work that we've done hasn't been listened to. And by the way, I, I come from a defence background. Okay, well, I'd be happy to chat with you after and see what we can do to integrate these ideas. This group was actually set up by myself, so I think there might be a different, um, two different groups operating. But yeah, I'd love to talk to you afterwards and get some ideas. Do you have time for one more ping pong? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Naeem Khan. I am from no. the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. The boss said no. Oh, <laughs> sorry. That's fine. We, re we really ran out of time for... 
six minutes. I'm sorry. So let me invite now Eric Kennedy for the tour guide presentation. Thank you.